scumbag like that, like I'd be pleased. I thought you were just gonna go with like he was just gonna go to a different pawn shop. <laughs> He's like, you sell kitty porn here? <laughs> like maybe, and then just crack somebody's head yeah, open for sure. guys, welcome to another episode of the Nerd You're Looking For podcast, a weekly nerd culture podcast that discusses the culture through various segments. My name, of course, is Patrick Kuhn, alongside my co-host, as always, that Tyler Hunt. How's it going, man? It's going very well. How are you? I'm good. Have you had a chance to, to get your Dawn of Justice ticket yet? Oh, shit. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should probably do that. We may I, just be going to see two different showings. I mean, uh, I haven't been to see a movie in... A little over a week, so yeah, I need to do that. Or yeah. we might very well be seeing different <laughs> showings. You're right. I'll be so pissed <laughs> because I only got my ticket for Showplace East because I knew that's where you would want to see it. <laughs> and so if I don't, if we don't see the the same showing, I'm gonna be kind of pissed because I could just saw <laughs> at the, a closer movie theater if we were just gonna see separate showings. I could uh, buy your ticket from you and then you go see it in the theater. You want yeah, to we see could it do that, but I mean, that seems like a bit of a, a lot of work. I don't think that the six thirty showing is going to be sold out like i think that movie's tracking to do well but i think we'll be all right and plus if you bought your ticket from me um there'd be a little juice involved <laughs> what, who, what kind of juice like 20 percent. oh i thought you were going somewhere else with that never uh, <laughs> <laughs> i've never heard it interest or anything referred to as juice yeah man <laughs> what they say i, I watch the- movies <laughs> <laughs> what movie is? I watch movies too. I've never watched like gangster movies. People call it juice, okay? <laughs> Just trust me. People call it juice. <laughs> I don't I'm not confident enough in your street knowledge to ever use that term in my own life so Yeah, for sure. You just go out and just talk about people. Uh talk with people about juice. For sure. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But yeah. anyways, yeah. I got, I, th- I actually got in an argument with a guy uh at work the other day cuz he was convinced that it came out while it was, we had the argument yesterday he, that Dawn of Justice came out today. Oh, man. <laughs> In the age of the internet, that's a really easy argument to settle. Yeah. He, I was talking about Daredevil and he was like, Oh man, I, I can't wait for, to see Dawn of Justice tonight. And I was like, What are you, what are you talking about? It comes out, it comes out next week. And he was like, No, it, it comes out today. I'm going to go see it later tonight. I was like, No, if it came out today, I would have seen it yesterday. He's like, Well, you can't see movies on Thursday. <laughs> I was like, Who are you? <laughs> Why are we why are we talking right now? <laughs> you should have just let him go with it like so he could show up to the theater. You know, yeah. One for Dawn of Justice, please. But that doesn't really pay off for me because yeah. I'm not going to follow the guy to the movie. Well, theater. you should have followed him too. That would've been great. Yeah, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been <laughs> creepy at all. I would definitely would not have lost my job. <laughs> just go and follow people around. I think he might have been trolling you. Like Dawn of Justice. Uh, I don't right. think so. Oh. I don't think this guy knows. Yeah. You can't see movies on Thursdays. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. All right, so we start off each episode by just checking in with each other. We call it what we're into. So, Tyler, what are you into this week? Well, besides Daredevil, which we're going to review later, which took up a lot of my time, um, I watched another Netflix show uh, last weekend, actually, is like as soon as we got done recording our last episode, it's called Love. Yep. It's produced by Judd Apatow. And I don't know, I wasn't really too interested in this show at first. I had seen a couple trailers for it, but, you know, 10... 20 to 30 minute episodes is not a huge investment. So I thought I'd give it a try and I ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I would Um, at first. And, you know, with all the promotional material and your kind, what you kind of think going into it, it's going to be a generic rom-com show, but it's really not Uh, as the episodes go on. It really starts to chip away at the characters, especially the character Mickey, who uh, Jillian Jacobs plays. It turns into something a lot deeper, uh, especially for that character. You know, she's like trying to fill voids in her life. She struggles with addiction. It kind of gets a little dark, but it, I don't know. It's weird because it's dark. It's dealing with dark tones and themes, but it also kind of maintains a levity. Um, it, it stays lighthearted and a lot of the interactions and the, and the jokes are fun. It becomes a lot of 
more intricate between those main characters uh, played by Gillian Jacobs and uh, what is it? Paul, Paul Rust. Rust. Paul Rust, yeah, yeah, who also writes most of the show and uh, co-created it with Judd Apatow. Or I think he created it by himself and Judd Apatow just produced it. But anyways, um, he, he plays the other character and they start off with a friendship and, and you think it's going to turn into a will they, won't they? Kind of yeah. like, you know, more generic sitcoms. And it really doesn't. There were a couple episodes that were hit or miss there's one episode where andy dick shows up and i really didn't like that episode because i think andy dick is i think that's the next episode I'm yeah gonna watch. I, I don't i mean it was just a weird it was a weird episode yeah. it was weird that he was in it and i find andy dick very annoying so i was oh, yeah, kind of disappointed sure. with that episode. i think that's his thing <laughs> yeah yeah um but but i mean for the most part it was a really enjoyable show um i would definitely recommend it one of the standouts for me was uh the actress who plays mickey's roommate her name's claudia o'doherty She's Australian, and I thought that she was just fantastic. There's a couple yeah, episodes really where, where I thought that she really shined. So I would definitely recommend Love. I started watching this, but like I said, I, I haven't finished it yet. I think I'm through like six episodes, and it's it's great. I like it a lot. It reminds me a lot of Louie, just that type of awkward kind of ho- comedy. Oh, yeah, you're sure. you're more laughing at the characters than you're laughing with them. And so I, I just I think that type of humor is really funny, and I, I just like this show a lot. Yeah, for sure. I like Paul Rust a lot as the main character. For sure. His nose gets a little distracting uh, from time <laughs> to time. But uh, Gillian Jackson, is it Gillian or Jillian? Do you know? Uh, you're a community fan. I, I would say Jillian. Well, either way, how you pronounce it, she's she's really great in it as well. And I know that that's from the brief amount of community I've seen. That's a lot different from what she's done in the past. So uh, I've really enjoyed her as well. Oh yeah, for sure. She's she's really funny, and it's a different type of character, which I like. Yeah, it's, she's not she's not this character in Community. So oh, for sure, it, it's kind of cool to see her uh, do something a little bit different. I liked um, what's his name, Kyle Kinane is yeah. in this show. He's great. Which he, he looks weird without his beard, but um, I didn't mean for that to rhyme. Anyways, uh, I think he's a really funny comedian, and so it was kind of cool to see him in kind of a, a bit role, sort of, in the show. I don't know if he comes in more uh, towards uh, the later episodes that I haven't seen, but he kind of plays a smaller role, but he's really funny. I can't think of the guy's name off the top of my head, but he's been in uh, Married. He does a lot of uh, At Midnight shows. He plays her boss. Yeah, the guy with the beard. Yeah, yeah, he's Uh, really funny. I can't remember his name either. Yeah, he's really funny in this. It's just the the cast is really great, and just the show is 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 kind of underrated. I don't think it it's doing. I I, like. I don't hear people talking about it as (laughs) much. It's not doing Daredevil numbers. Yeah, yeah, for for sure for Netflix. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would suggest at least the six episodes I've seen. Awesome, man. What are you into? What I'm into, I saw a movie and it was kind of a spur of the moment. My wife and went and I went to go see Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Yeah. Every weekend we try to do something like uh, just take a couple hours because we're both pretty busy and kind of have a a date night and we usually try some some restaurant we haven't tried and uh, we went we actually went to go see Shiler's or we went to to go eat at Shiler's and, and there's this is a big deal for Evansville if you live in Evansville you know probably know what that is but it just reopened recently and the the wait was an hour and a half so we said fuck that and we went to just a nearby restaurant that we had never tried before and it was kind of a bummer <laughs> like it wasn't <laughs> great and so we didn't want to end the night on just us going into this restaurant so I was trying to think of uh, something else to do and of course that our kind of our go-to thing is to go see movies because we're both big movie buffs and my wife loves Tina Fey. So, uh, we decided on this movie. I also love Tina Fey, but honestly, this movie just didn't really interest me all that much. I mean, I love 30 Rock, but this is a completely different kind of movie. It's based on a true story. It's about this, uh, reporter, uh, Kim Baker, who is kind of bored with her job. She works at a, a news station and she's just kind of bored with it. And so she volunteers to go overseas and cover the, the war in the Middle East. And I'll have to say after watching this movie, even though I wasn't that interested going in, I was pleasantly surprised at how much I liked it. It's kind of that fish out of water story. Um, at the beginning of the, of the movie, you're kind of laughing at her. Yeah. Just kind of the awkwardness of her being there and just her being so green and not really knowing what, what's going on. And like some of her interactions with the soldiers, I thought was really funny. Like at one point she's interviewing one soldier and she's like, well, how do you feel about the Afghanis or the Afghans? Or I can't remember what she exactly what she says. And he goes, he, the soldier corrects her. He's like, no, those, 
those are the, that's the money and these are the people. And it just, it was really funny just her being so green and, um, not knowing what she's doing. And then of course, as the movie goes on, she gets, she adapts to her environment and it, it kind of takes the whole, the movie kind of takes a different shape. I like it cause it's, it's, it's serious. Like you said, kind of like love it was a serious. It talks about really serious stuff, but it's funny when it needs to be. Martin Freeman's in this movie yeah. and he's really funny. Um, his relationship with Tina Fey starts off as kind of flirty and they, they, they're kind of weird with each other. And then obviously, uh, it, it blossoms into a much more ro- romantic relationship. And it definitely has a, a message to tell this movie. But for me, the one thing that I will say about this movie is it had way too many messages. Like, I, I think that. Obviously, it talks about the war and it talks about the soldiers dealing with the war. And obviously, Kim Baker is a woman t- played by Tina Fey. So there's a lot of her trying to cope with how the Middle East kind of views women and kind of treats women. And so there's a lot of that. I feel like if this movie narrowed its focus a little bit, instead of trying to talk about four or five different things, they try to talk about two or three of those things and really hit home. Um, it would have been a much tighter movie and it would have, I, I think it would have hit people a little bit harder than it. Cause I think this movie is going to be quickly forgotten, even though I thought it was a solid movie. Um, and it was definitely funnier than I thought it was going to be. Awesome, man. Yeah. I was definitely interested in seeing this movie. I was actually going to go see it. Thursday night, I think, but there wasn't yeah. a late showing of it anymore. So I think it's on its way out already, which is For sure. disappointing. Uh, I do want to catch it at some point. However, Yeah, I would definitely suggest it. It's probably not a movie that I will buy yeah. or maybe not even watch again. But I that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. It's just certain movies, once you see them, you can kind of just not have to. Uh, <laughs> it's not even like it's a I, – I made it sound like it's a chore. But it's just I've seen it. I, I experienced it and I don't really need to see it again. Like it's not a movie that necessarily has much rewatchability, but I definitely liked it a lot. Awesome, man. All right. So our next segment is just plainly called comics. Tyler and I read a ton of comics. Me, not so much this week, but uh, <laughs> we like to spotlight one or two a week. So Tyler, what'd you read this week? I read uh, Poison Ivy, The Cycle of Life and Death. I, I thought about picking this yeah. up, but then I never, I just never did. Yeah, don't, don't pick it up. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a mini series. This is the first mini series Poison Ivy's ever had. It's going to be six issues. And I believe the third issue was just released this week. So, um, I had read issue one whenever it came out and then I caught up with two and three just a few days ago. And issue one was really promising, but by the time you get to issue three, it's kind of off the rails a little bit. Uh, I respect that this comic exists. I, I love the character of poison Ivy. I named my dog Ivy. Uh, I feel like I kind of have to, I had to read That's it. That's why you <laughs> named her Ivy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like I had to read it, uh, just given my dog's name. And I don't know, man, it is, it's really weird. It's a little too weird for me. Poison Ivy's already a bit of a weird I character. I was going to say she's kind of a weird character. Yeah, but they get, it gets super Fucking weird. Hippie. <laughs> so basically, this comic it it's not really necessarily connected to any of the of the other Batman universe comics going on, but Poison Ivy regains her her identity as Doctor Pamela Isley, who she was born, okay. and she's working for this company uh, that does stuff with plants, of course, and. Nobody knows she's Poison Ivy, which is weird to me. It's like her secret identity. And she's not necessarily a, a hero or even an anti-hero. I'd still classify her as a villain, but she kind of, you know, goes home and becomes Poison Ivy again. And and she's kind of doing her own experiments. The, what really just threw me off for this comic is one of the experiments that she's really focusing on is uh, with this plant that ends up giving birth to two babies. All right. See, super, <laughs> super fucking weird, right? So, like, I mean, there's some elements to, to this comic that's pretty cool. Like, Harley Quinn pops up in the first issue. And if you know anything about Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, they kind of have, like, a relationship. And uh, the the end Like of, a lesbian <laughs> relationship? <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of been implied that. Um, but, you know, the end of uh, – ep- not episode, issue three – sees Catwoman kind of come into play. Uh, Ivy needs All Catwoman's right. help with something. <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, as soon as I got to the page where, like, this plant gives birth to two human plant 
hybrid babies, I was just kind of done. I, like yeah. I'll, I'll finish it out. Um, it was pretty cool. Midtown actually had issue one signed by Amy Chu who wrote it. And I bought that and framed it and hung it up. And I'm a little bit disappointed. <laughs> that, You're that, embarrassed that I pulled the trigger on that, uh, after issue one and I'll leave it up. Like it's cool to have something signed like that, but I just, man, I can't get over the, the plant babies. <laughs> I really yeah. can't. It's, it's too weird for me. Like there's, there's some cool stuff that happens, but in the end, plant babies i I can't do it yeah. so uh, i don't know i'll finish out this mini series because i'm already half done but i don't recommend diving into it if you're looking for a great poison ivy story unfortunately yeah i'll be skipping this one yeah all right uh so the comic i want to talk about is actually the book that you talked about last week i, I took your recommendation and picked up power man and iron fist number two well, i picked up number one as well that would be weird if i just started <laughs> off with number two um i didn't pick up this book when it and it first came out um a couple of weeks ago i guess and i really liked it it's a really fun book i wouldn't necessarily put it up um in the same class as maybe deadpool or howard the duck or even at Ant-Man, uh, where those books are just really, really funny. Yeah. Um, very meta and kind of, uh, poke fun of it at itself. But this, this book definitely doesn't take itself too seriously, which I enjoy. Um, there's a lot of cameos. Like in number two, there's a, a Spider Woman and, uh, a Gwen Stacy who is also kind of another Spider Woman. Spider Gwen? Yeah. They, they kind of pop up, but it's just a weird kind of cameo, and it's just kind of uh, very I, light. The whole the whole book. Can I stop and ask you a question real quick sure. while we're on the subject of Spider Gwen? That threw me off a little bit because I thought that she was like a different multiverse. So whenever Secret Wars no. ended, is she like just alive now and she's Spider Gwen and like she's in the same universe as Peter Parker again? Like how did she, that work? She came from um she uh, there was a and I might be confusing things because a lot of shit's happened since secret wars but uh there was a um an, a story arc in uh, amazing spider-man called uh, spider-verse yeah and so there was a lot of spider-man yeah. that came through there um and she was one of them but so she is from another universe to- yes but now she's in our universe or yes the in main the main universe. one yes okay thank you that clears a little bit up for okay. me because i was really weirded out whenever she showed up because i thought yeah. that she was separate from everything else but no, no, no. all right sorry to interrupt yeah it's fine anyways like i said this book does just doesn't keep it or take itself too seriously i think it's a great introduction to the characters i mean I, obviously i i know of these characters because i read a lot of marvel books but i never really read anything with just them and so it was kind of cool to get a, a good introduction to these characters um there's jessica jones in here as well luke cage and jessica jones are married and they have a kid and yeah. so they they have a lot of subtle jokes about that in in this book and i did like the tombstone stuff even though he takes kind of a back seat in issue two but him his interactions with his henchmen are really funny in, yeah in the second issue so I definitely suggest it if you don't really know a whole lot about these characters and you want to get caught up before their uh, respective Netflix sh- series come on. I would definitely suggest picking this up. Yeah, man. I, I mean, I talked about it last week. I really, really am digging this comic as well. Did This is a little fast forward to the Daredevil stuff, but did you see the the brief trailer for Luke Cage? when? Yeah, I actually – it played after you finish Daredevil season two. Yeah. I hadn't watched it. I'd heard that it gotten released, but I hadn't watched it, and it just so happened to – it was one of those where it just gives you like the 19 yeah. seconds or whatever it is, Yeah, uh, and it just played, and so I watched it real quick. I mean the tone – I mean it's only like 20 seconds, but the tone of that and the music and stuff makes it sound like it will be a little bit more – Lighthearted, uh, lighthearted than yeah, yeah, Jessica Jones and Daredevil, which I think would be a, a good move on for sure. Netflix's part. So that's what I'm hoping for. It ha- kind of has the the feel of this comic a little bit. Yeah, so. for sure. All right, man, you ready to move on to nerd news? For sure. So every week we highlight some of the big nerd news stories that have come up since the last time we spoke. This week is no different. I just have a few stories here, Pat. The first one uh, happened earlier this week. I believe it happened on Monday. They officially confirmed the voice cast for The Killing Joke. And announced that it'll be coming out this summer. The premiere is going to be at Comic Con, and it's a pretty sweet voice cast. We already knew Mark Hamill was going to be doing the Joker. We have confirmation that Kevin Conroy will be Batman, and Tara Reid, who is going to be at Indie Pop Con in yep. uh, a few months, is going to be Barbara Gordon uh, slash Batgirl slash I guess not really Oracle, but by the end of it, 
Yeah. <laughs> Close to Oracle. Um, Spoiler alert. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, she, I don't know if you knew this, Tara Reed actually did Batgirl in the animated series. So it's no, like I didn't they're, know that. they're getting a lot of that voice cast back for this. So that's pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Oh yeah, for sure. She's one of the ones that I'm looking forward to seeing at any PopCon. She did some voices for, uh, Mortal Kombat. Oh, did, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm a huge fan of that, those games. So I'm looking forward to getting her to sign some yeah, stuff. Yeah. I know we had talked a little bit off the, or texted back and forth whenever they announced her off the podcast, but Troy Baker was there last year and I yep. got him to sign a red hood action figure from Arkham Knight. So I'm going to definitely try to get her to sign a Harley Quinn figure from Dark Arkham Knight just to kind of go with the red hood. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. All right. So this was kind of misleading whenever i saw the article title um but it is kind of a cool concept so i saw an article about xbox wanting to be cross-platform to where they would let their their players also play with people on pc and other game systems which was implied playstation 4 obviously Uh, so whenever i saw that i'm like oh it's happening and then the article more or less was just like xbox is just open to it and they're yeah like they have that ability and then sony ended up putting out a statement saying that they were you know open to it as well we'll see if that actually comes to fruition i could definitely see xbox and pc happening a lot easier uh you know with the microsoft angle there uh it'd be really cool to play cross plat cross platform obviously uh you know i have friends that are huge pc gamers and not really into their consoles and I'm not a PC gamer at all. I'm super into my Xbox. So it'd be cool to play games with them. So I, ho- I hope that that comes to fruition. I'm not going to hold my breath, but it, it'd be pretty awesome. I remember whenever, oh, what was it? There was a game that came out like a year and a half ago. I don't remember what it was. It was released on PC and Xbox. And one of my buddies was like, hey, let's play together. And I thought that he had it on his Xbox. He's like, no, yeah. no, I have it on PC. And I'm like, why the fuck yeah. <laughs> would you think that we could play together? When has that yeah. ever been possible? So it's pretty cool that that won't be an issue maybe in the future. Yeah, it seems like it. it's it's one of those cases of why is it taking you this long to do? Yeah. I mean, especially between the, the Xbox and, and the PC. Like you said, there there's that Microsoft angle there. Because, I mean, I can stream my Xbox on my PC, yeah. which helps when my wife wants to watch direct tv or whatever but it just seems like that would be the easiest way to do or like i don't understand why we can't do it yet yeah um the whole playstation and xbox thing that that gets a little bit more convoluted but it'll definitely be cool i don't know how often i'd take advantage of it but it'd definitely be a cool option to have out there yeah for sure we'll see what happens there so this one i caught me a little off guard with the timing i don't know indiana jones 5 has been announced Ugh. for July 19th, 2019, with Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford returning. He will be 77 years old in 2019. Yes, yeah. Yep. There's a follow. I know you're the one that usually does the nerd news, but I saw this the other day. Did, have you seen the follow up story? Uh, no, I don't believe so. That the the writer for oh, Christmas yeah. Skull will I be returning to write this movie? David Cope, or however you say his last name. Yeah. yeah. Why? I don't know, man. I, I don't know how much blame of that movie is placed on the writer and how much blame is placed on like Steven Spielberg, but I just, I don't know. I don't know how you do this movie with him being so old. Like he would, in my opinion, you know, barely Han Solo and force awakens, like yeah. watching him run down the corridors and stuff was kind of hard to watch a little bit. So I don't know. I don't know how you do this and how many years, what, three years. Yeah. I know that, I can't remember where I saw this interview, but I, I do remember him talking, Harrison Ford talking about how the plan, especially with the original trilogy, was to eventually get to the point where Indiana Jones relied more on his wits than his physical ability. Yeah. So I guess at this point, you'd almost have to, right. you were forced to get to that point. With the character. Like, what do you, how do you explain Mutt Williams? Cause I guarantee Shia LaBeouf's not coming back. Oh, no, no, no. Like, how do you explain all of the shit that happened in Crystal Skull and just continue? Like, you, you almost at this point have to hand off the mantle. Yeah. Like, you can't put everything on Harrison Ford in this movie. So there's, he's going to have somebody with him. I mean, it can't be Mutt. So, yeah. So I, I just don't know where you go with it. Hopefully. David Copes had some years to think about what he did and uh, can give us something that's good. My fear with him being the writer, obviously, 
you can't do anything with Shia LaBeouf, but it seems like by choosing him to write this script is like, oh, well, he's finishing what he started. No, let's, let's just, if I were to make this movie, if I had my wish, you want to almost do what Day, Days of Future Past did with The Last Stand, get rid of Crystal Skull. Yeah. Uh, kind of wipe that from the record. But it seems like by choosing him that they're kind of finishing his idea uh, for the film. So that's that's kind of a that's kind of a bummer for sure. Yeah, I don't even know how you would wipe it from the record. It, yeah, like, it's just it's a mess and we'll for see. Sure. It just we'll see it's a it's a it. bummer because you have this solid trilogy and then they come along and they make this other movie and it's just like it's almost like they need to make another movie to atone for that movie when that movie shouldn't even have made and he should have <laughs> just stuck with the the first three. So it's just it's kind of a bummer. Oh, for sure. Uh, kind of sticking to the Harrison Ford side of things, they have reportedly narrowed down the people auditioning for Han Solo, the young yep. Han Solo movie. Um, and the three people are two I've never really heard of. I've, I've seen and then one that I'm really pulling for. So it's Taron Egerton from King's Yeah, Men. I'm guessing he's the one that you're pulling for. Oh, for sure. Ald- Alden. Einrenreich, uh, and then there's no way I pronounced that right, but uh, he's w- most well known for Hail Caesar, which I saw. Oh, uh, was he? Uh, what's his name? Hubby or uh, I'm Hobby? Ass- or- I'm assuming I haven't seen his picture. I'm assuming it's the cowboy as you're yeah, yeah. talking about. Yeah, 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 I'm assuming it's that guy. And then um, also an actor named Jack Rayner, who is best known for Transformers: Age of Extinction. Her and boyfriend? I'm guessing. I, oh, I honestly, God damn. I honestly uh, don't even remember that movie enough to remember a young man in there. So I'm guessing it was her boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm pulling for Taron Egerton. I think that he kind of has the charisma to pull it off. Uh, I, I like him quite a bit. Do you have an opinion? Obviously, I mean, obviously, I agree with you. Have we had this c- discussion? How do you feel about them making this movie? Are you excited about it? I mean, obviously, we're uh, Star Wars fans, so we're going to go see it. But I like the idea of doing that. Is I li- this the I- Lord Miller movie? Yes. Okay, cool. I like the idea of being able to go back and tell stories from that time period, like they're doing with Rogue One. And, you know, everybody likes Han Solo. Everybody, I think that there is a compelling story about how Han and Chewie meet and how Han gets to where he is in A New Hope. But, it, I mean, it makes me nervous. It's not very Star Wars like to recast a character like that and go back. And I don't know. It, it might be a little messy, but. Lord and Miller are very talented, so I'm going to yeah, give them I mean, the benefit of the of the doubt there. It's Star Wars. Like I said, it, we're going to go see this movie regardless. But I think them being on it makes me makes me a little bit more confident in it. But I just I don't like the idea of, of recasting a person that was already in their 20s when they made – like we already kind of saw that person. Like yeah. I, I don't see how you make – you recast him. Well, well, he's a younger Han Solo. What, was he like 16? Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't understand how you can recast it. We've already seen that person. Yeah. So it's it's hard to go back. I mean, even though the prequels were horrible, at least there was a logical, like we were going and seeing Darth Vader when he was a child. We haven't seen that. Yeah. I mean, we've seen Han Solo in his 20s. He's not going to look anything like the, I mean, somewhat like these guys, but I'm hoping that this movie is good enough that I'll forget about it, but I just, I feel like that's going to be really distracting. Well, I mean, like they hit the ball out of the park with Ewan McGregor playing Obi-Wan. Cause I, yeah. I believe that he grows old and grows into Obi-Wan, but I don't believe that in 10 years, e- Taron Egerton looks like Harrison Ford. No, like, you know, I, it just doesn't really fit continuity for me. I agree that there's some intriguing stories that they could make with Han Solo I like the character, obviously, but I just feel like there's so much more that you could touch on in the universe that you don't have to necessarily make a Han Solo movie. I think without obviously getting into spoilers, I just think that his story, his arc that ended in Force Awakens was so good that I don't think you need to revisit that character again. If you're listening to the Nerds You're Looking For podcast and you did not see Force (laughs) Awakens by now to where we can't spoil things in that movie for you, then you're probably listening to the wrong podcast. Yeah, for sure. I probably probably should have ended on that story because the last two are pretty lackluster, but we'll we'll go through these last two really quick. Uh, Gotham was renewed for a season three. I saw that, unfortunately. I mean, I knew it was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I stopped watching after episode two or three of season two. So I'm kind of done with the show at this point. Yeah. Will you even go back and 
maybe. I don't know. We'll see. It doesn't matter. Like yeah. it I know all of the stories. Yeah. And they're done a lot better than they're doing yeah. it in the show. So I just I can't get on board with the monster of the week stuff on that show. Yeah, it's really bad. Yep. And where where did you stop at on that show? I got I think about four or five episodes into the second season. I yeah. was just like I had given up on reviewing it. Obviously, I reviewed every uh, episode of the first season and that was homework. Yeah. That was a chore. That was horrible. I like when the second season started, I felt sick to my stomach about it <laughs> because I was like I felt I felt just just awful. It was a I have like PTSD about it. Yeah. Because it it was really bad trying to trying to think up stuff to talk about. I just really wanted to write how much I just hated the show. <laughs> but I, I felt like I needed to be somewhat objective. And then I got four or five ep- episodes into the second season. It was just like there's so much on TV right now that's so much better yeah. than this. Why am I wasting my time with this show? Just because I love Batman. And it just, I don't need to see baby Bruce anyway. So yeah. it just, I don't know. Yeah, for sure, man. It's, it's a struggle. Uh, last one is video game news, which I'm really excited about. There was a report that leaked that said Red Dead Redemption, a sequel to that game will be coming out in 2017. Did you ever play Red Dead Redemption? I did. Unfortunately, I never beat it because my roommate let me borrow it. And then like a dick, like <laughs> two weeks later, he's like, oh, yeah, you keep talking about how much you like playing the game. I kind of want to replay it. So I'm going to have to take that back. <laughs> I was I was so pissed. <laughs> oh, that would suck, man. Yeah. Uh, but I, I loved that game. It was it was fantastic. They put out the DLC for it where it, it was Undead Nightmare. Yeah. And that was a ton of fun. So I'm really excited for a sequel to that. And hopefully the report is true for sure. All right, man. You ready to move on? Yeah. Um, the next segment, we just kind of call it our, our main topic just because it changes from episode to episode. This episode, obviously, we kind of teased it a little bit. We're going to review Daredevil Season 2. Um, it was released. We're recording this on, on Saturday, so it was released yesterday. It was released at uh, midnight California time, so it was 2 a.m. our time. I had rewatched the first season uh, a week leading up to this I think I finished the season finale of, of season one, like Thursday. So I kind of, it worked out perfectly that way. Um, I went to bed early that night, like an hour early and, uh, got up at two and watched the first couple of seasons or the first couple of seasons, first couple of episodes. And then I was falling asleep again. So I, I went, took kind of a power nap, <laughs> got up for work and then watched the rest of it when I got home. Well, most of it. And then I, I watched the last couple of episodes this morning. So yeah, I, uh, I did that last year with season yeah. one. I, I set my alarm for 2 a.m. and watched the first episode at two. And this year I thought about doing it. I was off. I took off Friday to binge it and I had watched Kingsman Thursday night and fallen asleep. So my Xbox was on. So my buddy Mike started sending me Xbox messages like Daredevil. I'm so excited. Yeah. And this was at like 1 a.m. And then he's sent me a message like five minutes later. He's like, where the fuck is it? It's, yeah. it's after midnight. I'm like, oh, it's it's uh, California time, it's, uh, Pacific Standard Time, whenever we get it. So it'll be 2 a.m. He's like, that's horse shit. I did uh, literally the exact same thing last year. Yeah. That's how I knew that it was going to be 2 a.m. this year <laughs> is because I did the exact same thing last year with yeah. season one. Yeah, but like I said, I took off work for it. I binged all of it Friday, and it was fun. It was a good day. Yeah, for sure. We're going to do this kind of like a, we do our movie reviews. We Last year when we reviewed this, we went episode by episode, which is, I mean, it, it's a great show. So, I mean, there's stuff to talk about each episode, but I think the review goes a little bit smoother if we just kind of do it like we do a movie review. So if you've listened to this podcast before, which of course we, we hope that you do, um, we start off each review by talking about our broad strokes. So broad strokes season two of Daredevil, Tyler. Overall, I think that this is a great season of television. Uh, it manages to take what we loved in season one and keep some of it. Uh, then, you know, add a little bit of new stuff as well and, you know, never be boring. So it yeah. kind of mixed the old with the new really well, in my opinion. Things were a little lackluster. I think the last few episodes, it, it lost me a tad. Oh, but, really? But overall, a fantastic follow up to season one. And I'm excited to see what they do with season three. Yeah, season one for me. Did a lot of the heavy lifting. Oh, uh, for sure. I mean, obviously had to introduce the characters, kind of introduce the tone of the show. And so season two didn't have to do as much of that. They, they still had to introduce the Punisher, obviously. And they, they, uh, 
picked up where season one left off. So there was definitely some new stuff that, that they brought in, but season one did a lot of that, that for them. Like, for example, you don't see Fisk until the second half of, of the first season. And in this season, in season two, you see Daredevil and, and the Punisher go at it in the very first episode. Yep. So I like that. I liked that there was very few things to complain about with season one of Daredevil. And it seems like they heard all, all of that. They heard all of us complaining about just a few things, nitpicking, really. And it seems like they really worked hard on fixing those in season two. For example, like like I said, it was a slow burn in season one, yeah. which is not a bad thing. I think that that made the show even more like the payoff at se- the end of season one uh, just works so much better because it was a slow burn. But in season two, you, they just get right to it. It's action packed from from episode one. You don't see Daredevil in the Daredevil suit until the <laughs> end of the last episode of season one. And I think you see him more in the Daredevil suit than you see him as Matt Murdock in this season. Yeah. So there's a, there's all those little things that they it seemed like they heard all of our complaints, the f- very few complaints that we, you would have about season one, and they kind of fixed it. So I, I really appreciated that. I also liked the fact that they kind of teased Matt and Claire. Not Claire. Is it Claire? Karen, Karen, I get those two confused all the time. Uh, no, Matt and uh, Karen, they kind of teased them in the, in the first season, and they actually explored that in the second season. I was afraid that it was going to be a lot of will they, won't they kind of stuff, and they kind of got right into it in season two. Um, even though, spoiler alert, that doesn't really work out all that well. But um, I do like that they didn't really tease it anymore; that they just kind of went right into it. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, so we'll move right along to the story. Obviously, this is probably going to be most of our discussion as far as the review is concerned because there's 13 episodes. So, Tyler, what do you think of the story? Overall, it was really well. I thought it did a great job of intertwining the multiple arcs that were going on because there was a lot yeah, there was. that was going on this season between Electra, Punisher, The Hand, and a few other things I won't spoil. Uh, just a lot going on with many of the different characters that this show had for season two. And it did a really good job of, like I said, intertwining the stories. And, you know, when you have multiple arcs like that going on, you don't necessarily become bored. Like I love season one to death. Uh, season one is a great season of television, but it was very much a big bad. And, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, I love big bad stories. That's what I love yeah. about Dexter. It's like it's all about Wilson Fisk in the first season. And this second season's not so much like that like you have a punisher arc an electra arc an arc with the hand just uh, a lot of smaller stories that intertwine over 13 episodes and i think that they did for the most part a really great job of that um you know like i said in my broad strokes it lost me a little towards the end like i don't know I, i don't know that this season necessarily stuck the landing as well as it had hoped to um i don't think that that takes away from much of it because it was a really fun ride. It, it just, I don't know. It felt rushed towards episode 13 for me. I, there's so much to say. There's so much yeah. story in, in 13 episodes, you know, foggy and Matt have a really great relationship in this season that starts off where they're kind of back on better terms with their law firm. And, you know, they, they kind of fight a little bit through this season and, and their re- friendship and working relationships really tested. And that was one of the more fun relationships to watch in this sh- this season, which I don't know that I would have guessed that coming into it. I don't know. What what did you think about the story? I really liked how season two, like I said, in broad strokes kind of picks up where season one left off. I love the fact that they were able to touch on that whole half measure that Daredevil's basically just a half measure um, plot line mentioned by stick, which I also thought was kind of weird that they used the exact same phrasing. <laughs> The Punisher calls him a half measure, yeah. and that's exactly what Stick called him in the first season. So I thought that was kind of weird. But at the same time, I loved the fact that they they didn't leave that just kind of a, a one-liner in season one. I loved how that they picked that up in, in season two. I loved the idea of there kind of being a blurry line between the Punisher and Stick and Daredevil. That there's really just – I mean, Daredevil – or the Punisher says it. You're just one bad day away from being me. And so I, I love that idea that – uh, just the the different philosophies that that they have. Um, I liked that every time that you thought you know who 
the real villain was you were mistaken like like you said there wasn't that big bad there wasn't just one villain in this season which in season one you obviously have wilson fisk so there is that one big villain throughout the entire season so i liked that there was just every time that you thought you okay well it's the punisher no wait it's the irish mob no it's (laughs) and so I, i liked how every time that you thought you knew where the season was going, it went completely different direction. So I like that. You just kind of had the the mini, mini arcs, like you mentioned. Um, I will say that the whole blacksmith stuff didn't really hit for me. No, That's I the stuff either. that I didn't really like because um, they kind of – they kind of build him as like the second coming of Wilson Fisk. And then I didn't know who he was. I guess it's a character that they, they made up for the show. And that storyline, I, I'm trying not to yeah. spoil as much as we physically can. It, it had the potential to be this big reveal and this big, yeah. like, you know, art closure. And it was just kind of forced. I like, yeah. I definitely see what you're saying. And I kind of assumed that it was that particular character. At that point in the show, it had to be somebody that we've seen before. Yeah, for sure. And when you go through it, you kind of, it comes down to one or two people and exactly like it was kind of foreseeable. Yeah, for sure. I liked how they brought back Black Sky from season one. Yeah. I don't know if it necessarily paid off for me. I liked the hand. It got a little weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have that in my notes as well. Yeah, it it definitely got weird, and I'm not sure if I really believe the Black Sky stuff. I mean, obviously, there's something mystical about that particular. I mean, the hand and and everything. They kind of every time you think that there's some mystical force, they kind of break it down. Like obviously, they use the underground tunnels, so there's not they don't just appear out of yeah. nowhere. So they try to ground it at. At certain points, but at other points, they obviously can come back from the dead, essentially. And so it was, it was definitely kind of weird. I disagree. I think it pays off really well at the end. The problem I had was there was a few episodes before you get to that last part. Uh, like, I would say the the last two or three episodes were good. I, I wasn't crazy about, like, episode nine and ten. Like I would see, for me, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, like, nine to twelve it was built like this whole season builds up to a certain point and then nine, 10, 11, 12 plateaus for me. And then 13 felt rushed. Yeah. Like I think that you could have burned that over those last four episodes and really made it huge. And instead it just felt like super rushed in 13. Like, I don't know. I I was kind of checking the time, like, all right, how are they going to wrap this up? And yeah, you know, I mean, there's loose strings. I mean, obviously we'll probably see this season in three. Where yeah. It, They're not going to wrap everything yeah, up in season two for sure. But I just, I didn't feel gratified like I did in season one. I will agree to a certain extent, the hand stuff, I got to a point where it was cool to see them and it was definitely yeah. cool to see daredevil kind of meet his match like it made sense like they're the ultimate opponent for him because of the their training and the fact that he can't track them as well as he can track other people so i i liked that yeah but for a couple episodes they kind of drop the punisher stuff and we'll talk about notable episodes here in a little bit most of my notable episodes were the punisher he's one of my favorite characters me too in all of comic books and so I like the idea of him kind of him and daredevil, just the, like I said, the, the kind of the blurry line between yeah. the two of them. And so I just think he's a really intriguing character. They kind of drop him at a certain spot. They, they mention him with, uh, Karen here yeah. every once in a while, just kind of remind you, Oh, he's still active. He's still going to be a player in this, in this story. It was just kind of disappointing that they, there's a couple episodes where it's just like, Oh yeah, that guy that we, <laughs> that we focused so heavily on the last or the first few episodes kind of, they kind of dropped him. And the, there's one episode uh, in particular where they set you up that he's going back on this killing spree and it's obviously not him. Yeah. I mean, it's so obvious that yeah. it's not him. Um, so that was, that was kind of disappointing, but for the most part, I, I liked the fact that there wasn't that big bad that you talked about, that there was just these kind of miniature arcs here and there, and that I never felt like I knew who the real villain was going to be because they just they, – they touched on a lot of different stuff. Yeah, I, I just – you know, you were saying with the hand, like, 
you like that stuff. And they teased it so well in season one. Yeah. Like with the fight between Daredevil and Nobu. And they teased it just with Stick and just a few episodes just to give us a little bit of a taste. Yeah. And then they really explored it in season two. And I just didn't feel like it lived up to that tease. Yeah, it was definitely weird. I didn't like the kids. <laughs> I thought that was that was fucking weird as shit, man. No, it didn't feel like Daredevil. It felt like a horror movie all of a sudden. Yeah. But, I mean, Daredevil's always had that kind of mystical like, quality yeah. to it. It's not necessarily the supernatural part of it that I don't like. Yeah. I understand that there's definitely a supernatural part of the Daredevil side of things, as well as especially Elektra. I just, like you said, man, I, it, it lost me a little bit with how they went about it. Yeah. So how did you feel about the Electra stuff? Did you – because we mentioned when we talked about the trailer when that was released, I talked about how Electra, especially in that trailer, felt shoehorned. And I was afraid that she was just going to be kind of an afterthought. And I, I really liked that she was a main player in this season because I thought oh, they sure. were just going to tease her and save her for, for season three because you can only do so much in one season. Yeah. So I like the fact that they didn't tease her at all. They, I mean, I mean they came was- out – and she was a main player was, in this yeah, season. Yeah, full force ahead. Yeah. Uh, I thought that she was great. I love that character. Oh, we'll get to performances in a second, but yeah. like she was played very well and written very well. Much more like the Electra from the comics than our Daredevil movie or the Electra movie. Yeah. Which I only saw bits and pieces of. So I saw them in the theater, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It was done very well. She was definitely more Electra than Jennifer Gardner was. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean... <laughs> As far as performances, and I guess we can just get right into it. I mean, there's not a whole lot to say just because everybody was on top of their game. Oh, for sure. I, I like, loved everybody in here. I didn't think that anybody did a bad job or really – I think everyone did so well that it's kind yeah. of hard to, to point, oh, well, he was fantastic because everybody was oh, kind of whole on a whole new level. I mean – Everybody that came back from season one continued to be great, and yeah. all of the new people were great as well. I think the people we should probably touch on are how John Berthnall and Elodie oh, yeah. Young were. And for me, they were both great. Like I, I kind of mentioned already, already Elodie Young, like to me, now she is Electra. I yeah. thought she really embodied that. And then John Berthnall kind of had a bit of a harder job because the Punisher has been played multiple times previously yeah and he kind of had to make it his own and there were times where i saw a lot of shane in his performance yeah, but it's kind of a shane like character it is and i really there were some definitely some more emotional scenes with the punisher where he recounts what happened with his family i don't think that's much of a spoiler if you know the character and i really bought into that like i oh, really yeah, that, bought into him being tortured and being kind of just angry at the world so yeah that that whole scene at the the graveyard, yes, the, that the was episode. that was great. We'll get to that whenever we get to our episodes. Did you tear up? Out. I didn't tear up, but it was definitely it got me. Did it? Like he he was fan fucking tastic in that oh, yeah, scene. For like sure. you know, Daredevil season one was really overlooked as far as the Emmys go, and like for me, best supporting actor John Berthnold, if only for that scene. Oh yeah, for sure. Let, let's touch on the action before we get into notable episodes. I liked – not that season one didn't have action. Obviously, it has one of the coolest action scenes I think I've ever seen. Yeah, the hallway. Oh, yeah. And it feels like they almost kind of wanted to top it a little bit, yeah, especially yeah. with this uh, a particular episode that I, I want to talk about, uh, New York's Finest, and I'll, I'll actually get into it when we talk about the Noble episodes. But that Dogs of Hell fight where he just kind of oh, yeah. works his way down from the rooftop and awesome. just kind of fights. It was almost like they, they took the hallway scene from season one and just kind of put it on steroids yeah. like they they wanted to kind of go a little over the top and it just worked so well just him working with the chain and oh, he had the awesome. gun on one hand it was just it was fantastic i loved yeah. the action in this it seemed like in season one especially re-watching it i noticed a lot that and it may have just been the budget because it's a tv show uh versus a movie a lot of action happens off screen if you notice yeah. in season one especially where he goes to um madden gow's uh like um her warehouse yeah almost that entire scene happens off screen and so in this season it seems like they maybe they had a bigger budget i don't yeah. know but most of that you get to actually see it oh for sure and so i, I like that a lot especially with him and electra just kicking ass uh, against the hand was really really cool Oh, absolutely. The action was top notch for sure. Um, that season or the episode three that you're going to talk about, the, the hallway scene with the dogs in hell is by far steals the show, but almost 
every episode has a bit of an action piece in it. Yeah, for sure. Which I really was pleased with. Like, uh, whoever does the fight choreography for this show should be given more money because it's oh, fantastic. Yeah. And you know that the Punisher has a few hand to hand, uh, combat scenes and he's fantastic. Daredevil's fantastic. Electra's fantastic. It's just top notch across the board. Yeah, for sure. And there was, wa- there wasn't as much like parkour, like flippy do's <laughs> in, in this season, which I appreciate because that gets a little old yeah. in, in season one, especially when I rewatched it. It seemed kind of unnecessary. There's some stuff with Naboo that he kind of does a lot of flippy do's, but <laughs> flippy do's. Yeah, flippy do's. I'm pretty sure that's the technical term for him. <laughs> that, that's the karate term. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, yeah, let's just get right into the notable episodes. All right, you want me to go first? Yeah, for sure. So my favorite episode of the season by far is episode four, Penny and Dime, which okay. we touched on already. It has the the emotional cliffhanger with – uh, well, it's not really a cliffhanger, but the emotional moment where Daredevil and Punisher are in the cemetery and Punisher kind of recounts what happens. You mentioned it got to you. It was definitely my favorite performance uh, of the season for sure is in that scene. Um, I love that it dives into the Punisher psych because for the first – you know. Two and a half episodes, maybe halfway through episode three, they touch on it again. But it, the Punisher is just like the psychopath that's killing people and there's no rhyme or reason. And it's in this episode that Matt Murdock kind of finds out what's driving the Punisher to be this vigilante and is really emotional. There's like the scene whenever they're escaping from the Irish mob was also fantastic. Some great action pieces, uh, set pieces there. And then this episode just kind of has the best cliffhanger with Electra showing up at the end. Spoiler yeah. alert. Uh, you know, you've seen it in the trailer where she says, hello, Matthew or whatever. And that's the tag of this episode. So, you know, the first four episodes were this really superb Punisher story. And then the tail end of this episode kind of sets you up for what's going to happen for the rest of the season. So it was definitely uh, my favorite episode by far. For the sake of this review, obviously we binge watched this all in like a day or so. Uh, Oh, like 30 hours we basically watched the entire season so i'm actually thinking about re-watching this season again here shortly in the next week or so because this may be my favorite episode of the entire series so far oh for sure yeah i just i everything that you mentioned is great i just i don't want to to kind of have that knee-jerk reaction until i, I re-watch it but yeah it's just it's fantastic the torture scene is great i'm actually working my way trying to th- find the actor's name that uh plays the the mobster yeah he was great that, he was just fantastic he had a very small part but in the scope of the season but he was great it seemed to me especially at the beginning with the way they kind of teased the irish mob he seemed like okay well we've seen it in in season one with wilson fisk he's kind of take his place and then obviously i won't spoil anything but that doesn't happen and so i just that was kind of the first preview of what was to come in later in the in the season like there wasn't going to be that main villain um yeah and so i i appreciate that i just like the fact that there was there was so much going on in this season that uh or in this episode there's just i mean the escape with them kind of coming together and working together is just it's just fantastic the torture scene was kind of hard to watch it at points. Oh, it for just, sure. it was just so well done on, on every, every aspect of it. It just, it's fantastic. Like I said, I just, I don't want to come out and say that it is my, for sure, my favorite episode of the series because that's so knee jerk and I'd like to rewatch it first. But yeah, it was fantastic. All right, man. What episode would you like? Uh, like? Well, I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the episode right before it. Um, episode three, New York's finest. This is where that whole rooftop fight happens. So we, we've touched on that. So I, I won't, I won't talk about that. But the reason I really loved this episode was the fact that, like I said, in broad strokes and in the story, the idea of there being that blurry line between Daredevil and the Punisher is really great. And it is really well uh, explored in, in episode three where they're just kind of Daredevil is chained to the rooftop and they're just kind of going back and forth. Ex- exchanging kind of, not real blows obviously but metaphorical blows and yeah. uh, arguing with each other and they both make really good points and it just it was really fun just on um, well i mean maybe fun's not the right word but it was just i enjoyed watching them kind of exchange philosophies yeah. and that's just a really interesting concept to me the, the that blurry line between the two and absolutely and of course the the fight is is amazing and 
I just, I, I really like the Punisher stuff in this season. And so a lot of my notable episodes, actually, I picked three notable episodes and they're all Punisher episodes because I think he was the strongest of the villains, even though, um, I appreciated all of the, all of the, the miniature arcs in this season. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you mentioned Punisher being one of your favorite characters. Like if I did a f- top five comic book characters, I think the Punisher would actually probably be in there. Like I just, yeah, for sure. I love this character. I love the complexity. I love the vid, uh, how he's a vigilante. So obviously I nutted my pants a little bit whenever they yeah. announced that he was going to be in season two of Daredevil. And I'm really happy that I wasn't disappointed with any of the stuff they did with him. For sure. Next episode. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, I got one more. You said you did three. I did two. Well, one of them was Penny and Dime. Oh, so. okay. okay <laughs> that worked out. Uh, episode eight, which is Guilty as Sin. Yeah. I won't spoil the cliffhanger in this episode, but, you know, besides the Electra reveal, it's definitely the best cliffhanger in the season, in my opinion. Definitely a big moment that kind of ties back to season one a little bit. Um, this is the tail end of the Punisher's trial. And you remember that two issue comic book arc the trial of the punisher <laughs> i uh i was going to talk about episode seven and bring that up okay i mean we, yeah. I mean, let, we could should probably we, i mean we really could just tie the two together yeah, like episode sure. seven's the majority of the the trial and episode eight's the basically the end of it and yeah i really like that that's what season one miss was missing for me like uh in the comics you know Mur- murdoch and Nelson have these this courtroom drama yeah from issue to issue and that was not seen at all in season one so I really not only appreciated that they brought that into season two but they brought it in with the Punisher like the trial of the Punisher like that was great so I liked seeing the tail end of it and then the how it ends and the closure of it and and you know Frank coming face to face with uh, a certain character was just all fantastic and it kept me going like, Oh shit, what happens in episode nine? So, uh, episode eight was just kind of like that second adrenaline rush for me into the rest of the season. Yeah. Like I said, I, I picked episode seven. You can kind of group these two together cause they're, it's a two part, the, the trial of Frank Castle. And it just, like you said, it reminded me of that, uh, mini, mini series. Yeah. Uh, the trial of the Punisher. I just really, it didn't follow that comic book per se i don't think it was no. an adaptation by any no, means but it just reminded me of how much i i enjoyed that little run of, of the comic book as so, soon as episode eight was done i was like oh sh-. like i could probably stop for five minutes or ten minutes and read issues one and two of that yeah, yeah. and i didn't but i, I really want to reread those now. yeah it just i liked that book because it, i just like the fact that it's kind of like his greatest hits you kind of it that that trial format kind of gave the writers an excuse to kind of go through all of the things that he had done. And I like the fact that he it was his whole plan all along was to get caught. Obviously, that's not how the show works. So that's yeah. not how the these episodes worked. And I was I was a little bit disappointed in that because I almost kind of felt like that was going to be the end game. Like there was a reason why uh, he was doing what he was doing. And obviously there is, but it wasn't it wasn't his plan. Yeah. So that was he was kind of used as a pawn, which was a little bit of a bummer because I, I appreciate the character so much. But yeah, like like you said, it just reminded me of that. Uh, mini series, and so I really liked those episodes because of that. Oh, for sure, man. Well, that, I mean, that was my my other notable <laughs> episode. Yeah. You you just picked the other one. So you picked issue one, I picked issue two of the trial. Yeah, of the for sure. <laughs> um, so I mean, that's that's pretty much all I have for Daredevil season two. I guess we can go ahead and give it a star rating. Huh. I had not prepared for this. Uh, I don't <laughs> you know. hadn't prepared for the thing that we do every time we <laughs> review well, something. Yeah, but we, did we give? I can't remember. Did we give Mad Dogs a star rating? Did we? I think I, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we uh, almost always do. I don't know. Like it, it's somewhere between a four and a four and a half. And uh, too bad we can't give it quarter stars. I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stick to a four, just because, as I mentioned a couple times, nine, ten. 11, 12 plateaued for me a little bit and I could have done with some more, uh, skull on Frank Castle's shirt. So yeah, that was one thing that I, I failed to mention is they, they kind of, they took everything that we complained about in, in season one <laughs> and fixed it and then sort of fixed it. Yeah. They, they didn't do I that guess. with the Punisher. That was a little disappointing. Yeah. Each season in the last episode of the sh- season, somebody gets a costume. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't explain it or anything. Like, yeah. like I don't want to spoil anything, but 
just out of nowhere, he spray paints it on. Like, yeah, it, it really doesn't. And I, I was actually a little bit irritated now that you brought that up because he goes into that little tool shed thing and he <laughs> sees the vest and the vest kind of has that pattern yeah, on it. it. Does. And I was like, you motherfuckers, you better not just use that as the excuse. <laughs> like he better spray paint it on there. Yeah. And he did obviously, but there, like you said, there was no, there's no lead in to why he did it that way. Like in season one, there's a re- they start calling him the devil of Hell's Kitchen, so there's a reason why he kind of takes that up. He d- yeah. that's not his original idea yeah. for the costume, so I don't know that j- like that did just come out of nowhere. Like there's an X-ray that comes into play a lot through his trial that's yeah. of a skull, yeah. And I figured that it'd be wrapped into that some way, but they never do, and yeah. it was just kind of weird to me. There is a moment in see episode 13 with the Punisher, though, like he revisits his family's home and yeah. uh, finds something, and like that made me nut a little bit as well, but yeah. uh, overall, I, I could have done with some more Skull. Yeah, for sure. I am going to give it four stars as well. I, I think we agree that it does have, it does plateau, we just disagree where it plateaus. Yeah. Um. So, I think we, we agree a lot on this season. Like so, the, I'm going to... I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, the first four episodes of this show had me thinking that this was going to be my favorite show on the air right now. Yeah. Like, I would say it's probably Game of Thrones, but, like, the Punisher arc from one to four, I just wish that they could have kept that going yeah. for a full 13. Yeah, I just, I think with the rumors being what they are, that he's eventually going to get his own series, which I would be super excited for. That That'd be great. I just feel like they had to do something to kind of get away from him because oh, eventually, sure. even though he is, he's not really a hero. He's more of an anti-hero. Eventually they had to get away from him because he couldn't be the villain the whole season because then how could they transition to his own series where he's kind of the hero? Yeah. So I, I, I agreed that they got away from him. I just don't necessarily appreciate all of the things that they did once they got away from him. Like the, the kids and the hand didn't really yeah. pay off the way I wanted it to. Um, especially the, the blacksmith stuff was not great. Yeah. For but sure. anyways, uh, four stars. Like I said, we kind of agree that it did plateau at points. Just we don't agree at the same, same points. So yeah, that's Daredevil season two. I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm looking forward to rewatching it here soon. The problem with binging such a great show is that I completely blew my load in one day and yeah. I have to <laughs> wait an entire year for season yeah. three. I actually really enjoyed. I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise because it's a great show, but I really enjoyed watching season one and kind of revisiting it. I picked up a lot on season two. If I hadn't rewatched it, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have appreciated it as much. There's a lot of things that they kind of briefly touched back on and they had hinted at on season one. So I'm looking forward to rewatching season two again uh, here shortly. And I'm thinking that maybe if I can get some time, that I might just rewatch season one and two before season three. Cause I, I, I really enjoyed watching. Eventually that's probably not going to work out for me. <laughs> I'm not, when they get to five and six, I'm probably not going to rewatch the entire <laughs> show leading up to that new season. But since it's only been a season now and it'll be two seasons next year, um, I can still easily do that. So for sure, I'm looking man. forward to that. Awesome. All right. So we end each episode by, talking about our, our nerd favorite we take cha- we take turns asking each other a really nerdy question it's my week this week and i'm gonna ask you obviously we've touched a lot on daredevil season two but i just thought i would get your thoughts on what your favorite moment of the season was okay cool the the most obvious choice is the rooftop fight i will try to stay away from that because obviously that's uh pretty pretty obvious but i'm gonna go with the graveyard scene learning more about the Punisher and kind of his softer side was great. And not just that, but the fact that Daredevil gives the the credit to the cops, I thought that was a really cool move. Um, it makes sense with the character that he would do that. And just kind of the fact that he, he recognizes that the whole vigilante thing isn't necessarily working out the way he thought it would. And so to kind of give that credit to the cops, I, I thought really worked. And I like that about that character. And so I just, I it kind of checked all the boxes for me. Um, it definitely hit, hit emotionally. And I just liked how the, each character, uh, reacted. So definitely the graveyard scene for me was my favorite moment. Yeah. That's, that's a great scene. Obviously we touched on that quite a bit. I'm going to go with a much shorter moment, uh, that we haven't touched on yet that I really love that really just kind of showed the Punisher at work. Whenever he goes to the pawn shop. 
Yeah, that was a good one. I love that fucking scene. So he yeah. goes to the pawn shop looking for like a police radio and kind of gets into it with the clerk a little bit. And on his way out, the clerk tries to like start selling him porn. Yeah. And one he's like granny porn, like whatever. And then the last one is he's like he tries to sell him, you know, illegal, porn. illegal yeah. smut like a 12 year old yeah. girl. And uh, Punisher walks up to the door, turns the sign to close and grabs a bat and goes to work. And it's off camera. But that is like the embodiment of the character. And I, for I, lo- sure. I loved it so much. Oh, yeah, that, that's a good one. Like too. If I could if he could just have a season to himself in every episode, he beats up a different scumbag like that. Like, I'd be pleased. <laughs> I thought you were just going to go with like he was just going to go to a different pod shop. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you sell kitty porn here? <laughs> like maybe and then just crack somebody's head yeah, open for sure. All right, man. All right, so that'll do it for episode 86 of the Nerds You're Looking For podcast. As always, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. It's at the Nerds Podcast on both. Like us on Facebook. Check out our Twitch channel. Check out our YouTube channel. And follow us on Google Plus as well. You can email us at the Nerds You're Looking For at gmail.com. Vote for us for podcasts a month at podcastland.com. Rate, review us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, basically any good podcatcher you use. We're on it. I think that's about it for Patrick Kuhn. Tyler Hunt. We are the nerds you're looking for. Take it easy, guys. See you guys. Mm-hmm.